Oh. Okay. okay. I'll do an intro. Okay. Okay. So yeah. Larry. Larry, so good to have you here. Um, so Larry, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's no other word for him other than a genius of Giza, a genius in terms of deciphering the original geometries that were encoded into the Giza complex. And just now off camera, Larry was telling me about uh, some amazing things he's discovered. For example, he's discovered uh, an innocent looking shaft may not have been so innocent when Giza was built. Uh, I suggested to him, did it contain an obelisk? Did it contain something interesting? Because there is, it is at the center by 888 feet uh, from other things on the Giza complex. He's also talked about the fine structure constant, something in physics, which has been encoded into Giza, where the Hemiunu temple complex replicates the 110 billion, uh, a 110 billion of the speed of light uh, as a scale model. So Larry, how are you, sir? And, and I have to add, Larry runs the American Institute of Pyramid Research. Did I get that right? That's right. The American Excellent. Institute, right here, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Uh, Larry has met uh, Zahi Hawass many times. He has uh, been to Egypt many times and he actually also runs tours and he's discovered amazing things. Larry is the closest living being to an original uh, Giza, if I can say that, an original Giza mathematician. Larry, uh, you've told me some amazing things already. Um, how are you doing? You know, it's always good to talk with you, Charles. Um, you know, uh, you, you you have such an eclectic channel, as I've said before, and uh, you know, you uh, are open to things that, that others might not be. You're willing to look at things that you don't agree with, and some some channels don't seem to have that breadth of personality to be able to handle things that are outside their belief system. So, you know, I appreciate you, uh, you know, letting me have a word here or something. So let me uh, share a screen here, and. Uh, Let's see, I guess I'll go with this one right here. Okay, so uh, something you said there, I wanted to see, I think I just put on my desktop. Let's see if I can uh, find it here uh, real quick, uh, right here. Okay, so this right here, you, you said that, uh, you know, I was with Zahi Awas. Okay, this is the front page of the Cairo paper in 2014, when I was on tour with Zahi Awas in the initial tour after the revolution, you know, uh, uh, there had been devastation in Egypt after the revolution. All the ho the uh, hotels, you know, the people that make their living in hospitality had just had no business, and so we made the front page of the Cairo paper because Zahi Awas and ninety tourists are reopening tourism in Egypt. That man is pointing his finger to the story about us reopening tourism. And so that was a, a Polish tour company took a risk and they they did this tour. It was very successful. The next year, 2015, they did three tours and now they're doing one like every 10 days. And, and uh, you know, tourism is obviously back. It's flourishing uh, in Egypt. So, but I mentioned that because, uh, you know, I, I my relationship with Zahi Was is adversarial. Sometimes because I'm seen in pictures with him and stuff, you know, people think I'm just a, you know, but, but uh, I, I don't join the alternatives that uh, just immediately slam Mark Lehner and Zahi Awas and they're, they're hiding something. They're, they're legitimate scientists in their own right. You know, Zahi Awas is a publicist. So publicists, you know, they exaggerate. Any publicist does it. Hey, come, come to Florida. It's the best place in the world. You know, so, you know, he can be forgiven a little bit for, for exaggerating things. And, and uh, maybe he has hid some things at times, like the robot footage from up there that he was doing on his own. Well, any, any good scientist is going to do that. You do the research yourself first in your own lab before you go blabbing to the world. So I, I don't hold that necessarily against him. But anyways, but I don't, I, I don't just always settle with their conclusions. You know, even with Mark Lehner, uh, I've got somewhat of an adversary relationship, although maybe a little bit closer to him. But I, I mentioned their names as being the standard Egyptologist, but I, 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 I consider myself a total independent, and uh, I, I look at all the independent channels. Uh, I pick and choose, you know, like anybody. I'm eclectic, and and I, and I try and you know find my bearings. And so I don't immediately slam the Egyptologists. I don't immediately slam the alternatives. I like to you know be discriminating and you know pick the best from among them. So let me talk about the uh, 
of the fine structure constant since uh, you know you you mentioned that here. So here's on the screen is a uh, uh, you know the the uh, enigmatic number, the fine structure constant. So what the fine structure constant is? It's one of the major constants you know in the universe. There's pi. A lot of people know that one. Three point one four one five nine defines the relationship between a diameter and a circumference or an area. And there's uh, Euler's constant was discovered in the 19th century, uh, you know, 2.718. And that, that governs a lot of things like uh, the rate of interest growth and, and, and different things. And then there's phi, the famous golden proportion. But the fine structure constant, which is what's the Greek letter alpha is used to talk about it, is the most mysterious. And it's called the God number by Richard Feynman, the theoretical physicist. And it has to do with the relation at what uh, energy level electrons either emit or absorb an electron. So it's the, the number is on the verge of the physical world, electrons. Everything is made of electrons around us, you know, protons, neutrons, and electrons, and photons, light, which are more mysterious, ethereal, spiritual in a sense. And so the, this number, you know, is sort of like between the two worlds of, of body and spirit. And so it's it's magical and mystical. And yet, you know, the, the physicists who study it and are amazed by it and say it's this God thing, uh, they also say the, the, the universe wouldn't exist without it. So it's an important number and it's the number is one over 137 or the reciprocal is 137. So, so uh, let, let me show you something I was doing with, uh, okay, with that down here, let's see. Uh, all right, I gotta find, uh, okay, I guess this is it right here. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay, so um, I I did a video that's uh, I think it's my one of my most recent YouTube videos on the fine structure constant <clears throat> and how it is embedded in the Great Pyramid. But here's a second way it's embedded. So watch that video to, to see the first way. Here's a second way right here. So uh, let's look at. Let me just start with this this screen right here. Okay, so uh, this <clears throat> is an alpha and omega that I discovered in the Great Pyramid. Wow. Uh, you know, there, there's uh, there's the four letters at the entrance of the Great Pyramid, the Tetragrammaton. I've studied those. There's an alpha and omega on the the north, uh, the uh, southwest corner of the coffer in the King's Chamber. A very plain alpha and omega that Robert Grant discovered. And there's this alpha and omega, which is in the descending passage, right near the scored lines uh, that are in the descending passage, sometimes called the entrance passage. And uh, and so uh, you know. It, it's got like a Templar cross up above it if you look close up there. And, and so uh, it's got, you know, an alpha right there. It's got an omega, if you see it around it. And then it's got this uh, uh, inverted, uh, you know, alpha, which, which again made me think of the first letter of the Tetragrammaton that's at the entrance to the Great Pyramid, which is pronounced Debar which is my family name. My, my uh, maternal grandfather is uh, James F. Dubar, which his name, the name means word or holy of holies. So now you've got this V, you know, in there. And so, you know, I just think that that, that could be channeling the, the holy of holies. Okay. So, so here we are in the King's chamber, there's the coffer. Okay. So, uh, there, there's a, a picture I took in 2014 when I was with Zahi Oas of the entrance. This is the entrance that comes into uh, the King's Chamber, okay? And here's another view of it. I took this picture in 2014. Okay, so the coffer, which is in there, will not fit through that door upright. But if you if you turned it sideways, and I, I didn't get my graphic to, to do sideways, but if you turn it sideways, it will fit through there, okay? So, uh, so, so you head now into uh, the king's chamber. Okay, so there it is. So there's the soft mattress sitting there alone. And if you turn it on its side and you think, all right, because you did the first bit, wouldn't you? But you turn it on its side. Okay, so this is taking the coffer the height, five, the into the king's chamber. Okay, so. This is the number of coffers that fit there. Why did they choose that particular length? I wondered how many would fit in. There's not an exact number, at least not a length of So there it is. 
there. Okay, so so exactly 137.5 of those coffers fit inside the the king's chamber. Okay, now 137.5 is a number. But here's the golden angle. Okay, so you can see this uh, this uh, here. The green is to the red, and in what's shown there as the red is to the blue. That's you know the phi proportion. Okay. And so when you do that, you get an angle of 137.5. So this is just showing, you know, the golden proportion. A is to B as, you know, as AB is wow. to the whole thing, okay? So if the circumference of that circle right there is 432, you know, a very important number because the Great Pyramid is a 1 43,200th scale model of the Earth. And so 432 is related to the, the processional cycle. So if you take the circumference of that circle to be 432, then the diameter is 137.5. So you've got 137.5 as a diameter, but the golden angle is 137.5. Okay, so that's interesting that there's 137.5 coffers fit inside the king's chamber. Now that doesn't seem to be by chance. There's so much that's intentional in Giza. The fact that there's this, the one piece of furniture, here's the great pyramid bereft of anything. There's no gold, no silver, no hieroglyphics. You know, it's just this empty industrial room, except for this coffer. And then this empty coffer, but this empty coffer is exactly 137, fits in exactly 137.5 times inside the king's chamber. Okay, but so there's the 137.5. But 137.5 is not the fine structure constant. The fine structure constant, there it is right there. Uh, this is Richard Feynman who writ, wrote books about it, taught courses about it. That's the fine structure constant. So just like pi is a certain constant, you know, phi, this is, this is the fine structure constant. And uh, that's one over 137. Okay. So, and the reciprocal is 137. So those are the numbers that are usually associated with uh, the, the fine structure constant, which is called alpha. So there's 137.5 of, of these in the King's chamber. But listen, but half of this coffer is space. It's well known that, that the amount of physical granite there is, is equal to the space. So the space volume is equal to the physical volume, okay? So because of that, the physical part of the coffer takes up one one thirty seventh of the king's chamber because the inside's hollow. Wow. So here is the fine structure constant. This is unbelievable. This is, un you know, the point is people say, oh, that's crazy, it's crazy. Oh, really? Get a little boy, make, a, make blocks. Uh, I think Mad Simpson, an ancient architect, he made a model, I think for his kids, but he made a model that he's shown on some of his videos of this very thing. So make a block and you fit it in and it's going to be exactly 137.5 of them. But oh, the middle, the half isn't there. So the coffer the physical part of it is what is the fine structure constant number. Unbelievable when you consider what all, you know, because to people that are listening to this and what's the fine structure constant, even the physicists that have found it don't understand it. And Richard Feynman said, we'll never get a formula for it. Robert Grant, my friend, found the formula for alpha. He did. You just go to his Instagram page. He's writing papers about it with his mathematician friends. So, so it's, it has been discovered, but it's still mysterious. So if you don't understand that, it's fine. Even the physicists who know what the number is don't exactly understand it. It's this mysterious number that's related to physical matter and light. So it's like, it, to me, what it speaks of there's nothingness is 137 of these. In other words, the, you, you could take the physical part, which is 1 137th, or the nothingness, which is also 137. And so the, the 137 and the 1 over 137 in the king's chamber, to me, it symbolizes resurrection. And what is it? What does an empty coffin say? You know, that yeah. The guy's not here. The mummy made it. He made it to the next life or whatever. He's not here. So you might not agree with that, but the point is that that's what's being said. Okay, so th so there's that. So so that is another example of the fine structure constant in the Great Pyramid. That's amazing. Yeah. So uh, let me uh, stop sharing for a bit just so we see our faces here. Because uh, another thing I wanted to talk about. Well, uh, 
you mentioned uh, the, the 110 billion thing. All right, let me let me say something about that because uh, that that is amazing too. Let's see where I could go to show you something here. Let me just start like this. Um, I'll go to, uh, uh, let's see. Let's see what I've got out here. Yeah, I guess I put it away, let's see. I'll go to my desktop here and uh, I made a folder for this interview. It's got some things in it. And uh, okay, so this one right here. Okay, let's look at this. Here's a picture. That's not the one I want. Let's get rid of this guy. And uh, let's look at this picture. Okay, so if you go to Washington, DC, you know, a lot of people go to the National Air and Space Museum. It's, a, you know, a great museum. Well, this is an outside part of the museum. It's called the Voyager exhibit. So this mother and her kids are looking at the sun. And those other poles there are, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, at a one to 10 billion scale. In other words, that sun is one ten billionth the size of the sun. And the, the, uh, the display of Mercury and Earth are also exactly proportional at one ten billionth how far away they are from the sun. And if you take a 15 minute walk from this spot, you'll be at Pluto, 15 minute walk. And again, so everything's proportional, both in distance and size. And so the curators of this museum have used a scale of one in 10 billion. So just to show you another picture of it, let's, let's just do an overhead shot of the mall there in Washington, DC. So here's, here's a picture. So you can see the National Mall. So if you can read that, you can see the entry point down at the bottom. Then you go to Mercury, Venus, Mars, and then you see how far away a 15 minute walk to go all the way to Pluto, you know, passed by the National History Museum there. Okay, so um, I, was, I was mentioning to Charles uh, before, uh, so I, I don't know if I can find it quickly, but I'll just, I'll just say it here then. The Hemiunu template, which, which I've discovered in the Great Pyramid, it's, it's where the air shafts of the King's Chamber exit. So that point is at the 103rd course. It's 200 royal cubits across. So the Great Pyramid is like this, where the air shafts exit is. A, so if you take that slice out of the Great Pyramid, you have a square of 200 royal cubits. Okay. 200 royal cubits is 104.7 meters, 104.7 meters. So I was, I was showing Charles that, uh, that uh, I'm going to show you something from, uh, from our little pregame setting this meeting up today that you're watching here. Okay, so here was our conversation. So I said, are we wearing ties? Because you notice Charles wearing a tie and I've, I've got a you know, sport coat on. So we kind of dressing up for this interview. I, and he says, so 1047, my time. He's telling me when we're going to get on. And so I told him that's the number. That's the Hemiunu template, 104.7, 104.7 meters. So he, unbeknownst to him, that number, that's what I'm talking about now. So that, that, that 104.7 is, now get this, remember, Hemiunu, his name means human. He's bringing down to human scale, just like the museum curators did to make the solar system understandable, they took a one ten billionth scale, Hemiunu at a one ten billionth scale, pi over the speed of light is 104.7. Now pi is in the Great Pyramid, that's obvious. We can show that in many ways, many people know that. But Hemiunu, who's the architect of the Great Pyramid, who's got this 104.7 square template that I found a whole bunch of things it relates to, it, it, this, you know, so it's just incredible that pi divided by the speed of light, 299,000 meters per second. Just do the math. As a matter of fact, I showed my calculator. I, I took a, I did this on the calculator just before we, on this call. There's my calculator, Charles. All right. Uh, wow. If you can see, there's your 104.7. Wow. And it's, it's it, to the 10 billionth. That's what I did is I simply, you know, Go to Google, find out what the speed of light is, 299,000, you know, pi. I just punched the pi, you know, on the calculator, there's a pi button. So to make sure I got the value right, I just punched pi down here. So I took pi divided by, I put in the speed of light, I got this number. It's to the 10 billionth, it's 104.7, the very time you set for this meeting. So that, that gives an example of one of the ways I work. Well, I believe in science and rationality. I also believe in, in being led by the spirit, you know, but just uh, providence, singularities, uh, you know, uh, coincidences, whatever, you know, 
And so I, I knew this was one of the things I want to talk about because the time you set this meeting is 104.7. So, so there Larry, we go. Larry, synchronicity is main, it means that something is real and, and everyone who makes discoveries uh, finds synchronicities. Even people make synchronous discoveries at the same time, you know, they come up. Yeah, that's true. Independent teams come up with the same things at the same time as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and most researchers, even that experience that don't write about that in their paper because they want to be accepted in the scientific community and they, they themselves recognize that it happened, but they know that's not scientific. And I respect that, you know, but I do believe what you're saying that I think people experience that, you know, as a matter of fact, that Gary Osborne is a great researcher and he wrote that book about the Rendlesham, uh, you know, UFO incident uh, and uh, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the amazing stuff that came out of that. And I'll just put it in my own terms. You know, you have to study the way Osborne talks about it. He's more or less saying like, wow, like what, what I'm finding here, I'm being led somewhere. And he's just trying to be scientific. He's trying to just, you know, but he's, he has to admit that there seems to be another power operating here, you know? And so I've experienced that same kind of thing, including, you know, you setting the time of the meeting, which is an odd time. You didn't say five o'clock, six o'clock. You, you said 1047, 1047. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's plainly an example of what we're talking about. So, yeah. It was, it was an odd thing, thing for me to write. You know, I was probably being directed by the universe to write that. <laughs> there you go. So we're in sync. You know, the Alpha and the Omega is, is here. So, you know, uh, so one thing that... Uh, I'd maybe like to mention is uh, yesterday I happened to notice that my, my book, uh, Enoch, about uh, the Orion correlation theory. So, you know, Robert Baval, decades ago, he's written books about it. You know, he's, he's done co authorship with Graham Hancock, and I think Adrian Gilbert's different people. He's written about, you know, the Orion correlation theory, which he discovered as recently as uh, 2017 when he wrote a book about the Sphinx with Robert Schock. He put in the appendix, he was still pushing for scientists to accept the Orion correlation theory. So over the decades, he's tried to build a, a, a uh, respectability to something that, oh, that's that esoteric stuff. We're not going to get into that. And, the, and of course, the Orion correlation theory says that the three pyramids in Giza, you know, Khufu, Khafre, and Menkara are in the same orientation as the three belt stars of Orion, Al-Nitak, Al-Nilam, and Mintaka. So there's a relationship between those three belt stars and the three pyramids. And Baval, again, he's written books about it. He's still, as recently as 2017, pushing for scientists to accept it. So I wrote, a, I, what I did, and, and I say I'm the only person in the world that's done this, and I, I say that not to boast. I say it, I, every time I tell the story, I say it so that somebody hears this and says, no, I've done it. I, I want to find other people that have done what I, but I took every star of the constellation Orion, put it down to earth, and went to it, not just the three belt stars. Like if, you know, if my wife asked me later, well, how'd that interview, what, what did Charles, how did Charles look? How, what was he wearing? Oh, he had a great belt. Well, what kind of hat did he have? I don't know, what, what did he talk about? I don't know, what are his extra, because I don't know, but he had a great belt. You know, nobody is known by their belt, except for maybe a heavyweight champion, you know, got his belt, but you know. So, so the point is Baval stuck for decades. I think in the beginning, he tried to find other stars. He came to some, some dead ends. And so he just focused on the three. So what I did, is I said, dude, if it's really the Orion, you don't have an Orion correlation theory. You've got a belt theory. I want to take all of Orion. So I, I, I followed where, where the Egyptians placed Orion on Egyptian soil. And I went to all the places and I wrote a book about it. So I just noticed on Amazon yesterday that, that uh, uh, somebody really slammed me in, in the review of the book. And I could tell they didn't even read the book, but that, that's fine, you know. And, and so, you know, I'm mentioning that because that's another one of my discoveries. So again, so so the guy and the guy didn't even have a name. His name was uh, something like a ancient Egyptian protector. Like in other words, he's hiding under a name like that. I said, you know, my name's Larry Paul. Okay, you know, yeah. and and the things he said were just just you know, it's just wrong. I mean, he he slams me. It's you know, he's he's like this expert because I've looked at some of his other reviews and he is a legitimate Egyptologist. And his other reviews of people that are standard Egyptologists are like traditional you know, looking at things, but all of a sudden he comes to something that's a little different, you know, because in my book, and, and here's why it's different. I talk about things like we just talked about, about Providence. I was led in, by a cab driver. And, and so he slams that, that I've got a cab driver in the book, but I'm not, I didn't, and I, this book wasn't a forensic sign. I'm not like Baval, who in 2017, in the appendix to the book he wrote with shock about the Sphinx, he is begging scientists to accept his discovery. I'm not doing that. 
because I know some people aren't. I'm not, and I'm not making this scientific. I, I just think the Egyptians did it. I tried to show that. And in my chasing down on Egyptian soil, the places where, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Enoch, the Egyptian new Orion connection hypothesis. So instead of the Orion correlation theory, I've got the Orion connection hypothesis. So it's instead of theory, I've got hypothesis. Instead of uh, correlation, I use connection. But it's the new, because Bavals is the old one. So I've got the Egyptian new Orion connection hypothesis. And it says that just like the picture shows, I take all the stars of Egypt, or of, of uh, Orion, and where they are in Egyptian soil. And so that is unique. And you know, I did it as a travelogue, really because the things I discovered were of the order of 104.7, the time of this meeting. It's not scientific, but it's this providence that says, wow, Charles, you were in touch with the universe because you set a time. It wasn't like five o'clock or seven o'clock, normal times you set for meetings. It was this odd number. It just happens to be one ten billionth pi over the speed of light. Okay, so, and it's the, the Hemi new template. So the same kind of things led me here, but that doesn't mean you can discount them. I mean, obviously some people will discount them because I'm talking about sync, you know, synchronicities that happened that led me to see something. It's not, I, I'm not putting, you know, the virtue is not you setting the time of 1047. The virtue is in what that symbolizes that you didn't even know. And that's the kind of thing that happened. I was led by a providence, but it led me to something that was real. As you said, these things are real, you know? So the guy was slamming me and, and just the things. So I actually wrote a review then because I, I didn't know how to answer him. He doesn't have a name. So I just wrote a review of my own book. But the review is to just comment on the other review, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so, anyway, so, so I mentioned that to say that, you know, you know, I'll, I'll never, you know, sell millions of books like Baval. It's it, this really, uh, you know, is a small circulation. It's not, you know, I'm small peanuts. But it's real. I'm sorry, it's real. And it's an interesting read. I just think it is because as, as sometimes because I'm rewriting it, it, you know, I talked with you about that one time, you, you, you get made some good suggestions about how to rewrite it. And I appreciate that, you know, and I, I know, and I know you were right. I don't know if you remember when you gave me some guidance on this. But I know the things you said to me were right, you really and so that's one of the reasons I want to rewrite it. Plus, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen other things, you know, so I, it's I'm not a perfect writing is a difficult discipline, right? Am I right? I and mean, yes, it takes years to write even one book. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I do want to redo this and do it better, but it's still not. It's not going to be a scientific book where I'm just quoting standard Egyptologists and talking about their archaeoastronomy because, and and here this I really want to say this because, I really stressed in the beginning, how how am I going to talk about the as above so below the, the Egyptian maxim? How do I say that? Because I'm not a spheroid geometrist. I don't know spheroid geometry. I can't. And then it, what finally came to me to make gave me confidence to write the book is I don't have to be. I'm finding what the Egyptians did. Maybe they did something, you know, like me finding, you know, the 104.7, the, the, the pi over the speed of light. I didn't make that. It's in the Great Pyramid. I discovered when we say we discovered something, we discover something that already exists. So it's not, I, I didn't even create it. Hemiunu did, or so, Enoch did, or somebody. They get the credit. I just, by discovering it, I get involved with it, but they, they did the work. I could never figure out how to make a building that has pi and the speed of light embedded in it. You know, I, I can't, but I discovered somebody else did, okay? So that's the confidence I got. I, I, I realized this is what the Egyptians did, how they did it, how their Leonardo da Vinci's did it, which is what this guy was slamming me for. It's not scientific. I don't know how they did it. I'm just saying I found it. And that gave me confidence to realize I don't have to be the expert on the astro archaeology archaeology the you know i just need to find what they did and then somebody else can figure out how they did that you know but i'm just saying i'm just going by what's there so you know that gave me confidence that was the level at which i could write you know do this amazing amazing and and yes synchronicities are the way things happen uh even the interview we're doing today it was a it was a mutual willingness wasn't it when a mutual willingness happens, synchronicities occur. And well, yes, and, and you know, and something changed in you because I know you've been, uh, and as, as we all should, you know, just like me thinking about rewriting the book, you've been thinking about re uh, centering your channel or, you know, like maybe, I, am I read about that? You've gone through some yeah. iterations of trying to, you know, because you're, 
you know, whereas, you know, like you take ancient architects, Matt, everyone starts the same, the same music, and they has got that consistency, you know, and so, the, the, you know, I, I, I envy that, but I can't do it. It seems at times you've tried to do that too, but then you, you have an introduction that's big, but then you do a different one the next time. And that's like yeah. me. <laughs> so, but I, when, you're, when you're searching to find it, we all have to do that because, you know, YouTube is, you know, gearing us down now in the logarithm, independent channels don't do as well since that Logan Paul incident, you know, and, and they got slammed for, for promoting fake news people. So therefore, you know, the only people they promote are the Smithsonian, Harvard, you know, the New York Times, and you and me yeah. aren't that brother. You know, we're not yeah. the Smithsonian. Look at, what, look at what we're doing. It's like, so it's like 10 levels higher orders of power than, than, what, than what they're doing. Because yeah, we're I mean, bringing yeah. in other disciplines into what the Egyptians did. And, and what you're and doing is so, unbelievable. I mean, that's that's really the point at which YouTube turned because they, they took too, so much flack because of that Logan Paul incident and they changed a bunch of rules about making videos and stuff like that. You had to then get so many subscribers before you could, you know, get a paid channel and all that kind of stuff. And, and that, and now they've, you know, everybody says, even Matt Simpson, as big a channel as he has, he's still an independent and he's talked about how he's been hurt too. So even the big channels that used to, you know, get a lot of punch are still, feeling the pinch and then you you've been you had a very you know robust channel and you've been feeling the pinch too because i've read you you know talk about it yeah it so doesn't just, move. The, the subby the subscribers don't move it stays the same for years and years <laughs> yeah, exactly and, and you just know that there's more people that would be interested in your stuff but they're not really trying to you know help you find them because of the Logan yeah. paul incident so anyways um um what else did i want to talk about um the uh uh, well, one thing uh, that I found is, uh, you know, that Robert Grant and Alan Green have shown that that uh, Da Vinci went to Egypt. He was in Egypt. I mean, you, you really you've got to see it, but the, the, it seems undeniable once you once you see the evidence. Wikipedia won't tell you that, but you know, I, and I respect Wikipedia, but it, it, a lot of times, if things are a little bit off the beaten path, it doesn't it doesn't pick it up, you know. So uh, so he he encoded. The Great Pyramid in the Vitruvian Man. I was told the Vitruvian Man is the second most famous, you know, picture. I guess the Mona Lisa is the first, but the Vitruvian Man is the second most. So in the Vitruvian Man, you know, this this man that's you know in the circle and square. It's like man in relationship to the universe, uh, you know, and everything. And and uh, Da Vinci plainly encoded the Great Pyramid in the Vitruvian Man. I've done programs about it. To me, it's undeniable. And as a matter of fact, some of the horizontal lines that Da Vinci has on the Vitruvian man are not in your physique. There's no horizontal line across here, but the places where he has horizontal lines all match passages in the Great Pyramid, except for the upper ones, which seem to be where the, the void is being found. So it seems like he, Da Vinci knew of passages still to be discovered. So another thing that Da Vinci has, he's got a pyramid-like mark above the belly button of the Vitruvian Man, just look at it, just go, go, you, it's easy to find, go to the Vitruvian Man, do a close up, you know, on your, your, your program there, look at, and there's, there's a pyramid shape above the belly button. Well, we don't have a pyramid shape above, you look at your belly button, there's no pyramid shape up there, but Da Vinci has it there. And I discovered that not only is the Great Pyramid embedded in the Vitruvian Man, but the Minkara Pyramid, that, that, that uh, little uh, pyramid shape thing above the belly button really encodes the Minkara Pyramid. I've done videos about that. Okay. So, Will Wire, who's a great graphics guy in Boulder, Colorado, uh, he's been to Egypt with me. He showed me that on the arms of the Vitruvian Man, there are some slanted lines. Instead of the straight horizontal lines, you know, most of what Da Vinci has, it's got the square, you know, it's a circle, it's got the horizontal line, so it's all square. But there are these slanted lines on the arms, right, right near the biceps. So I followed those lines. Down. So, so, there's a, so, so you can place, as I said, the Vitruvian Man on the Great Pyramid. Da Vinci intended that. Okay. Well, it's uh, sacred geometry decoded has sh shown me and others have seen it. There's a five times great pyramid on the Giza plateau. Picture the center of Khufu, then take a line down to the very center of Menkara and then draw a straight horizontal. That pyramid is exactly the angle of the great pyramid and it's exactly five times the size of the great pyramid. And I've wow. shown by the I, and I, anyways, I've documented the third angle too to show that it's really meant to be there. So, so if you now superimpose the Vitruvian Man over that Great Pyramid, the one that's plainly on the Giza Plateau now, you know, top is in the center of Khufu, 
the vertice on this side is the center of Menkara. Okay, if you overlay it, those those lines point down. And uh, Robert Grant showed me a picture of the Philosopher's Stone, uh, 1688, by a guy named Mayer, and he the was drawing a pic. Of, you know, the Philosopher's Stone is an emblem. It's like oh, a I know logo. that picture. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And and so if you that picture, he's drawing on a map. So there's something about the Philosopher's Stone. So so Da Vinci was doing that. He 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 was drawing it. And so I took the Vitruvian Man. I, I did a program about this. Laid it over that pyramid on Giza, the same way you'd lay it over the Great Pyramid. And so I just followed those lines down in Giza. Now you're getting south of Giza. You're just going into the into the desert in Egypt. And I did a program about this. It led to a V. That that those lines where they converged from the two from the bicep curve line and the bicep curve line, which is on the Vitruvian man. Again, I'm not making this stuff up. Da Vinci put it there. It's to me, it's a rational conclusion to put the, the Vitruvian man over the Great Pyramid itself, but now over the Great Pyramid, the five times Great Pyramid, which is what I did, that's really there, you know. So people that don't believe that, okay, you buy, you can you, know, you can leave, but it's really there. Okay, so then I followed down and into the into the Egyptian desert, and the place where it comes on Google Earth, there's a V. So now I followed where the lines from the V went. One of them went straight through the holy shaft that I discovered and through the center of the Great Pyramid to the entrance of the Great Pyramid. That's where one of the lines went from that V. And the other line went down to the Pyramid of Lahun, a pyramid of the 12th Dynasty Renaissance. It's down in Fayum. Okay, so you've, so you've got one. So, so it's amazing. Think about it. You've got all, all these things coming together, which again, people that don't get this, they think I'm crazy. That's fine. You, you can think that. That's okay. You know, I, I'm not, not offended. I'm not offended. But to me, every step we took in that is, is rational. Okay? <laughs> da Vinci was in Egypt. He did channel the Great Pyramid in the Vitruvian Man. The Vitruvian Man is meant to be placed over the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid has a five times representation on the Giza Plateau. Many have recognized it, sacred geometry decoded and others. And so you place the Vitruvian Man over that pyramid the same way he's supposed to be placed over the Great Pyramid. You take those two lines that are on the elbows, the, the Da Vinci put them there, they must be there for some reason. Again, these horizontal lines are passages in the Great Pyramid, they are. And you don't have horizontal lines on your chest but the Vitruvian man does, and they match the passages in the Great Pyramid. So I follow those lines down. They come to a V formation. Look at my video. It's there. I'm not making it up. Why would I make this up? You know, I'm not Sitchkin. I mean, come so there's a V, and then the, the one line points up to the Great Pyramid. So think about it. Da Vinci has the Great Pyramid and the Vitruvian man. He takes us down into a part of Egypt and then points back to the Great Pyramid and then also points to the Pyramid of Lahun. Well, that's like the, the southern shaft in the king's chamber. The southern shaft points to al Nitak, which is the star in Orion that represents the Great Pyramid. Because remember, the three stars go to Khufu, Kapri, and Menkara. So it's uh, Mintaka goes to Menkara, and al Nitak goes to the Great Pyramid. So the Great Pyramid points to itself. For, for, apart from Da Vinci, the shaft, the southern shaft of the Great Pyramid points to al Nitak, which in the Robert Baval correlation is the Great Pyramid. So the Great Pyramid points to itself. And here Da Vinci has this line off the Vitruvian Man, which is in the Great Pyramid, that comes down to a place in Egypt. Remember that drawing you've seen of Mayer and the Philosopher's Stone drawing the sacred geometry onto a map. So we're being kind of told, well, don't just do sacred geometry in your head and be a little mathematician and you're on paper and you're getting all your stuff. Take it to the real world. And it comes to a V in Egypt, and one points to the Great Pyramid, and the other one points to the Pyramid Lahun. It's like amazing. That's incredible. Um, Larry, there is a possibility that um, Da Vinci, um, he had books which are no longer available in his possession because um, Gavin Menzies in his um, 1492, uh, was it 14, 1452, which I'm sure you've heard of, um, he said, yeah. he actually claims that Da Vinci had in his possession Chinese books and other books of the world, books with maps of the world, books with he he reckons Chinese inventions, but it could be books with ancient technology in them, and maybe uh, Da Vinci had some of the knowledge of the Giza pyramid builders in his possession. You know, I I think so, and another reason I think so is I did I did a video on the overlay 
of the Great Pyramid in Washington, D.C., and then a, the, which is there. I'm sorry, it's, it really is. Watch the video. And the, and the overlay over the Vatican, and, and it's plainly there. And what's amazing is the, the, uh, the statue by uh, Bernoulli, or not Bernoulli, uh, I forgot the man's name, but he, he's an architect of like the 16th century. He, he has a, a fountain that's there, and, and he's the one that designed the square. Remember, there's an Egyptian obelisk at the center of the Vatican, so it's not too far-fetched to think the Great Pyramid could be there because there's an Egyptian obelisk in the center of St. Peter's Square. And so the lines that radiate from that obelisk match the shafts in the Queen's Chamber, which weren't discovered until 1872 by Wayman Dixon. There's no record anywhere of the Queen's Chamber shafts until Wayman Dixon on a hunch from uh, Robert Menzies, who was a shipbuilder, and he said, maybe you should look in the Queen's Chamber for air shafts just like there are in the King's Chamber. And so Wayman Dixon, who was working with C.P. Isaac Smith, the Astronomer Royale for Scotland, uh, he, he, uh, he, he began chip, he, he, he measured in the Queen's Chamber where would be the analogous point to the King's Chamber, tapped a little bit and, and he found it. So for the first time now, since it was built, I say 4,500 years ago, you can say 10,000 years ago, but for the first time since it was built, now we know there's air shafts coming out of the Queen's Chamber. Oh, but guess what? The overlay that I discovered, I did a program about it, those lines on the Vatican designed long before 1872, it's been there long before 1872, plainly channel, show knowledge of the Queen's Chamber air shafts. And so I would think it'd be the same thing. The Vatican's known to have a bunch of books that other people don't have, you know. And so you're saying Da Vinci had other books that people don't have. I totally yeah. believe that because they, because they knew, because nobody knew about this till 1872, we thought, you know. So yeah, definitely there, there's a, you know, there, there's a, you know, some, there's a lot, well, and that's coming out in so many ways, because one of the things the alternatives, you know, wrap the Egyptologists for is, you know, they don't see the advanced civilizations that have declined, but, you know, their evidence, well, that's what we're saying. We're saying, in saying what we just said about the books that Da Vinci had, there's these books that probably go back to that time when there seemed to be a single world language. There was certainly a single language of megaliths that because, you know, there's so much relationship between Stonehenge and, you know, Teotihuacan, and, you know, the, the, the numbers show that there was a single knowledge of the earth at that time. You know, so we only thought that the modern age with technology and the internet that we now have a worldwide, no, they had a worldwide network before we thought people had the capability of having a worldwide network before the internet, you know what I mean? So that, that's, that's plainly there. So this would just be the things we just talked about, the, the knowledge that Da Vinci had, the knowledge that, that the, the, the guy that designed the, the St. Peter's Square, they had access to some of those things that go back to that era where the, this knowledge was there. So, you know, exactly, Larry. Um, so I've become convinced that there are books that no longer exist that these people drew upon. Uh, for example, even Shakespeare drew on lost Italian books, Italian plays and things. Totally. Uh, and, 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 and I noticed that there is, it, it, there, there seems to be, have been a strong Renaissance Italian investigation of Egypt. And either those books haven't survived or they're just in Latin. And the thing is, these days, people actually can't read Latin. No one can read Latin, um, <laughs> except for the people in the Vatican. Even the medieval historians, actually, I found that because I'm a medieval historian. And I, I, my professor told me, I said, to, I said to him, can they, the other professors, they can read Latin, right? And he said, no, they're pretending. <laughs> so no one can actually read these old books. Gallia est divisa in partis trace. Okay, so yeah, I took four years of Latin. <laughs> oh, good work, Gallia. Uh, okay, <laughs> it's a famous, famous speech from All from me, Caesar. <laughs> a lot of a lot of Latin students have to memorize that speech. Okay, so yeah, so it's Kikero, Kikero, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so uh, so yeah, I mean that that's like the burning of the Alexandrian Library. Same thing, you know. I mean, there were books there that you know plainly you know because i mean the, the guy that uh, that we credit with uh, figuring out the circumference of the earth uh the uh the uh greek guy what's his name uh erasthenes or something you know yeah. erasthenes oh he was only the keeper of the alexandrian library bingo oh, so so we wonder where he found out the circumference of the earth okay you know really so yeah, because everything everything that uh, the Greeks had, the Egyptians had, we, we you know you just study 
you know, all of them. I mean, Plato, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, geometry, uh, Euclid, uh, you know, all of them were in the Egyptian mystery schools. So, and, and even the, the Greeks say they don't understand their own legends, like Hercules, whatever, they don't know where they came from. So even their own legends, they don't know where they came from. Well, they came from, a past, from some other past. So, so all that we, we attribute to the start of Western civilization, you take a Western civilization course, you study Greece first, Greece is, you know, they're everything. Well, Greece got everything from Egypt. So, you know, that's one of the reasons I, you know, I've dedicated my, my life now to studying Giza and the Great Pyramid stuff, because it, you know, and I, I'm not as interested in Middle Kingdom and, you know, the, the, uh, the Tal Ptolemaic Pyramid and stuff, because it's the old kingdom where this stuff, you know, these secrets seem to be yes. hidden. So I, I just, uh, you know, I, I'm like, uh, I like studying prophecy. I like studying esoteric things. So that's why I, you know, I focus on Old Kingdom Egypt because I think there there are truly secrets hidden that are meant to be, you know, the, like the Great Pyramid. Stephen Braben has a really nice site in the Great Pyramid. It's called greatpyramids.com or something. But Stephen Braben, B R A B I N, he's he's done some brilliant work that he's making available now to the world. And and uh, you know. Uh, um, he talks about the way that the, the builders hide stuff, but they mean to. Well, they hide it so no one will ever find it. No, they find it so only the they hide it so only the searchers will find it. I mean, I really I really believe that. So that's what I'm engaged in. I'm engaged engaged in the search for finding these things that you know, like you know, today we we can understand to a certain extent. You know, we some people think we're in this great new. You know, we're on the verge of the new, the age of Aquarius, and all this. And well, in some aspects we are. On the other hand, this is a cancel culture. You know, you say certain things, you can be deprogrammed, deplatformed. You know, uh, hoodwinked, your Twitter account taken away. We see it happen to people that are saying strong things of, of a certain political bent, especially. That's why Da Vinci decoded things. That's why these artists decode things. That's what. They don't want to have the fate of Galileo. They don't want to be tried in the tribunal and killed. So they'll just hide things in their paintings. Why, why not just say it outright? Why didn't just, you know, Da Vinci write a treatise and say, well, you know, uh, the, the, I, I really understand some things about the Great Pyramid. And here are six things I understand that most people don't understand. There's hidden chain. Why didn't he do that? Because, you know, we're, we should understand that in the cancel culture, you lose your Twitter account if you say something. You'll be deplatformed. You'll be ridiculed, you know. And so that, that's the reason things are encoded. Because the, you know the the ruling elite say the Earth's flat, or they say that you know the Earth is the center, and if you don't say that, you know it can be dangerous. So that's why things are in, encrypted. I think that's one of the main reasons. Paul, so I, I don't think everyone's capable. Just like a lot of people have long since turned off. If anybody's watching what we're doing here, because like, oh, those guys are crazy, you know, and that's fine. It takes a certain amount of. It takes a certain. I don't know. You know. You, to see it, you got to be able to see it, you know, and if you don't see it, you don't see it, you know, that's why Jesus told parables, I think, you know, he's always telling parables, because, you know, he never said, listen, let me give you a theological lesson, okay, there's a father in heaven, you know, he's got 16,000 angels, and they're organized like this, that, you know, the red ones are over here, he never said stuff like that, he said, there was a man, and he had two sons, there was a king, and he threw a great feast, he's telling parables, this is the guy, this great spiritual teacher is telling parables, so there's a reason for that, because he didn't want to get hung too quick, you know, you know, you you're right. The Pharisees yeah. are going to ask you. Yeah, uh, he, he must have been talking to thousands of people. And I, I believe the Romans were watching him as well. So he had to basically use metaphors the whole, for the whole of his speech. He was totally revolutionary as well. <laughs> you better believe that, that, that Pontius Pilate and those Romans were worried to death about an insurrection. Because it would be under their watch. It would be their name. And Caesar would have their head. So you better believe they were watching Jesus, just like the Pharisees were. They were jealous of this guy that was popular. Like you say, he, a lot of people gathered around him, and they didn't like that. They wanted to be, listen to me, I'm Dr. So-and-so. You know, it's the whole Egyptology independent thing that we, you know, have going on now. So. Yeah, you're right. There was, there was definitely a secret police, and, and these things are, are, you know, these things are, are not known about when people read the Bible, and, and we have to appreciate it in that context, I guess. Oh yeah, yeah. There's plainly a, a, a hidden battle going on, and it, and it's going on now. While there are elements of the age of Aquarius coming, I, I do see, I, I get that, and I and I can join in the crowd that says that. At the same time, you got to recognize there's a big antichrist out there. I mean, what's the lockdown? What's the science for all this lockdown, Australia? What's the science for that? Like, try and try and tell me there's a science that says that that changes anything. 
I mean, it, it we, are, we are locked months. down. We are locked down more than anyone else in the world. I mean, UK has you know thousands of cases, tens of thousands of cases. They're opening up. We are we have a handful of cases, and we're locking down because we're trying to er eradicate it because we're an island. But at the end of the day, uh, yeah, it's apparently this variant is not as not as deadly. Uh, so yeah, I'm just saying, I you know, I I don't spend any time studying this. My wife does. I I get this from her. She she stresses on it. But you know, I I. I just, I, I do believe there's a conspiracy of sorts. There, there's a bigger agenda. There is a truly an agenda to stop a plague. I get that. That's part of the story. But the other part of the story is they're using this to get more control governmentally, to uh, experiment with certain things they're putting in the cocktails of, of the vaccines because they're all experimental. And, and there's evidence for that. You know, so, so you know, there, there's a, you know, a big brother. There's a, you know, 1984, there's this big government that's putting these requirements. And I don't really think you can, you can scientifically prove that these lockdowns are doing what they think they're doing but it, it can make them feel like they're doing something so that's fine i get that but i just don't think it really is doing anything i, I don't i don't but that's you know but the, i don't want to you know i don't usually talk about this stuff i really that's why i get into egypt i don't want to talk about this political stuff it's Absolutely. but you know i just just this week that's come in, into connection for me because somebody that was attacking me on the youtube channel you know, I realized it came down to what we're talking about. It was like, I was not giving a mainstream view and he was rapping me for not giving a mainstream view. And yeah. so I realized if he represents a lot of people that have a mainstream view of, of what I was talking about, then, you know, then he's chipping away at me and hammering away. And a lot of people who think they shouldn't get the, the vaccine because they've read about, you know, some of the things that do happen and some of the stories are hidden, but you, you go on the web and you can see all kinds of stories about people that had all kinds of bad things happen from the vaccine. And it says right on the one, when I got mine, it tells you right there, it's experimental and it's not an approved drug and all you could have all kinds of reactions. It says right there, it says it right on there. Yeah. And so, you know, be, because <laughs> of that, some, some people have decided I'm not going to get it, but then you hear about how they're pressured at work you know, the social pressure and stuff. And so, you know, it, it ends up chipping away at you, chipping away. And and then it's like, you're you're a bad person if you don't get vaccinated, you know? So now it's a moralistic thing. Now it's shaming, you know? And that's mm. the kind of dynamic that leads people like Da Vinci to, you know, to hide things. I mean, it's, right. we're, so we're in it, while we're in it on the, on the cusp of the age of Aquarius, we're also on the cusp of the Antichrist taking over. So, you know, yeah, uh, isn't it isn't it strange? Not much has changed since the uh, days of Savannah, Savannah Roller. And um, indeed, and yeah, and I'm personally, you know, I'm waiting as well. I'm waiting for more tests. <laughs> you know, uh, he, he was an amazing guy, Savannah Roller. Do you know that he had the whole Bible memorized? See, I, I, I'm actually trying to find out things about him. You know more than me, but I'm trying to find I, and, and I've noticed that there is no biography on him. Or at least I can't seem to find a biography on him. Like anything, you know, uh, Jason uh, uh, Brashear, I think his name is. He's got the Archaics channel. He boasts that he's the only guy that doesn't, you know, use internet sources because if you search on the internet, there's a limitation. He's got a bunch of those older books. He has a bunch of older books, ancient books that he's got access to, and he's and he's used, and yeah. he gets all his stuff from there. So, you know, and and as a matter of fact, I just bought this book because that, I wanted to get it. That's what I did on my channel too. Yeah, show me. Yeah, I just. I just bought this. It's an older book, but it's Andrew Collins, you know, uh, I know that one, yeah. uh, from the ashes of angels because the forbidden legacy of a fallen race. And he, especially as a chapter on Egypt, I want to see what he's saying about the etymology of Egypt. So he's going, and as I was reading through this for the first time, I think yesterday, it's an older book, but I, I just bought it on, you know, used, uh, you know, he's drawn from sources that are, again, you're not going to get these sources on the internet. It made me think of the archaics channel. You know, you, you, you get, you, you know, there, there's a bunch of sources that, again, if you do a Google search, you're going to be limited to this, you know, certain, uh, you know, universe of things that won't include these books we're talking about that, that are about Savernola, et cetera. That's, that's so true. I, I noticed that as well, Larry, uh, that, that the things you read in books, and you've got a brilliant library behind you. The things you read in books, you do not find online. Yeah, especially the older ones and stuff. Yeah, and a lot of the stuff that deals with, with you know. And but the thing is, it's so hard to sort out. You know, they say that you know the Emerald Tablets, you know, Enochian. It's so much stuff that's got the name Enoch or Esoteric on it. It's just was written in the Middle Ages, and it's not. It's not what people say it is. So you can't draw. You know that that uh, uh, Emerald Tablets thing was a you know a Muslim work in the, like the seventh century, exactly. whatever it was. It's, it does you can't prove it goes back to, to Enoch. You just can't, you know. So, but there's enough things like these these sources we've just talked about that exist 
that some people, I do think it's possible to piece together a true Enochian knowledge, a true esoteric hermeticism. But most of what goes on is hermeticism on the web and current people that think they're hermeticists are really just mishmashes from the Middle Ages that weren't that really don't go back to Enoch, which is where hermeticism started. Exactly. Been, yeah. And so and academics, you know, academics won't recognize that. They say it's early, they, they claim it's early Christian writings, funnily enough. Yeah. Yeah. Even though it actually even sounds like Egyptian hieroglyphic texts because it's short sentences. Well, you know, I, there, I've got a book on the library here. I don't know if I could pull it off right away, but it's it's it, and it's it, it's typical of, of this viewpoint that uh, that Christianity came from the Egyptian teaching. So, you know, Osiris, you know, being killed and you know all that. That that is a you know Horus, uh, Osiris, Horus is 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 the story that led to Jesus. But that what that fails to understand is sort of like what I was saying, the Greeks, well, really the Greeks got it from the Egyptians. So in this case, well, where did the Egyptians get this Osiris stuff? And it, it goes back to, I think, Enoch, because to, to, that's the source of, of you know, because there's a short line from Enoch to Noah to Shem, who's the father of Egypt, according to Psalm 78. And so, you, you know, you, you got the, this short, tight connection in the human race there. And so, the, the, the Hermeticist truths from Enoch, the Enochian, the true Enochian tables and the books of Enoch, which are fabled in the ancient world, the wisdom of Enoch and stuff, got its way into Egypt early on. And then Egypt, just like the Greeks transformed a little bit, you know, because I've studied ancient books of Egyptian geometry and they're different than Euclid. It's a different geometry. They both work. But Euclid's is a different set of maxims and theorems than, than the Egyptian. And so there was an adaptation. So while the, the Greeks got their stuff from the Egyptians, they transformed it. And the same thing here, the Egyptians drew on this, this past from, from, from Enoch. So they, there's an etymology and you can't say Egypt started it. And therefore, you know, we have to, and so because of that, Enoch is quoted in the book of Jude in the New Testament as prophesying the second coming of Christ. So if that's true, Enoch was way back here. If he knew about the second coming of Christ, then he knew about the first coming of Christ. So he knew, um, so, so he began to put into the human race stories about the Messiah who would come. Those got into the human race because again, the New Testament quotes Enoch who existed long ago, prophesying the second coming. So again, if you knew the second coming, you knew a lot of other things. So that's where Egypt got the stuff that ended up becoming Christianity. They got it. So that, that's that's the that's the etymology. Not many people know that, and I'm sure most people would disagree and just have shut the channel off right now. But I, that's really what happened. So <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, um, that's absolutely incredible. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I named this book. I use this, uh, what do you call it? You know, when you, what, uh, each letter stands for something, it's Enoch. So it's the Egyptian New Orion Connection Hypothesis. But I also got the name Enoch because I think, I really think that, uh, that the constellations were named by Enoch. Because here's the thing, here's the thing, Charles. Every effect has to have an adequate cause. There, for instance, seven day weeks all around the world. What's the cause? Well, the Bible says that God created in seven days. That's the strongest reason. I mean, there were, for a few times, the Egyptians had 10 days and French and the French Revolution had 10 days. So there have been some 10 day weeks, but most of the history of the world, Jews is a seven day week. So that effect has to have a cause. All right, so let's look at this effect. Almost every ancient zodiac, Sumerian, Chinese, go to where you want to, has the same set of names for the constellation Orion. That should absolutely not be true if evolutionary thinking was true so that every Aboriginal society would have said, oh, look, I see a 57 Chevy up there. Oh, look, there's a telephone. And the constellations would have had all kinds of names that were disparate. But that's not what we find. The effect we find is the constellations are 
near unanimous in terms of their naming. When you go anciently, there are some little differences and stuff, but pretty much there's a single etymology. The only explanation for that is that there's a single origin for the naming, and that's Enoch. Enoch, he, Enoch was, you know, what uh, Shishat was, uh, you know, in Toth. That's what Enoch was in reality. Toth is a, a fake god, you know, the Toth didn't exist, you know. That I hate to break anybody's bubble, but Egyptian gods aren't really gods. Okay, they don't really exist. They're, they're, they're nice thought patterns or something. But Enoch really existed. And he's the one, he, I think the word inch comes from Enoch because anciently there are no vowels. So Enoch is inch. You take the vowels off. And so you've got well, they, the they, they, they say it, mean, it means once. So it means one. It, and that could be because he was the, he, he, he taught every, the, one of the hermetic teachings is everything is the one, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the four, three, two, one, you know, it's everything is the one. So, uh, you know, so I think Enoch is called the father of mensuration. So he's the original Toth, you know, cause Toth is the number, he's the scribe. Enoch was the scribe, he was the number, he invented, you know, units or whatever. He, you know, he's the original, you know, cubits, meters, inch guy. And so he's the one that helped name the stars and those names stuck in the human race. Because again, every, every uh, uh, effect has to have an adequate cause. How do you explain the fact that there's a great unanimity through different cultures at different times around the world of the, of the naming of the constellation Orion? You know, it's because there's got to be a single origin. And I just think that that's, you know, that's Enoch. So, you know, people think that's mythical. Well, I think Toth is mythical. I think Hermes is mythical, but I think Enoch is a real person. And, uh, and he, he named the, the stars and we, we've kept those down through the ages until today. Because if, if that's not the explanation, you've got to give me one. You know, you've got to come up, you've got to come up with a cause that explains that effect. I've got mine, what's yours, you know? Yeah, I, I think you're totally right. Uh, there must have been ancient astronomy books written by Enoch. They were known about by the Giza pyramid builders. And those books have, I, I, maybe they've been copied down and copied down through the ages because that's what chroniclers did. And eventually it became, it became the works of Ptolemy or some other astronomer you know, and, and some of most of it was probably lost, but some of well, it they say lives. they say that Enoch was going to you know put two two tablets or monuments. So I think the Great Pyramid is one of them because that does have these things we're talking about. That they're embedded in geometry and math, and so that's one of his writings. But I think pyramid. it's possible. I think he did do other writings too. So it's going to be interesting what what happens with this uh, the void because uh, I'm reading right now uh, Scott Creighton's book. Um, the Great Pyramid Void Enigma. And so he, he looks at some ancient sources that aren't widely known that, that talk about what could be there. So remember, Da Vinci seems to have known that this void was there before the Scan Pyramids team you know, came up with it. And, and uh, one of the things is it seems like, it, it, seems, it seems to reflect the Grand Gallery. So you've got the Grand Gallery and right above it, you know, is this void. It seems to be about the same size, you know? And there's still a debate, even though the three different teams that worked independently on Scan Pyramids, even though they, you know, came, they worked separately and then they brought their conclusions together and they can't, they still don't know if it's horizontal or if it's slanted at the same angle as, as the Grand Gallery, but it's above the Grand Gallery and it's either, you know, horizontal or slanted at the same 26 degree angle that the Grand Gallery is. And one of the things that uh, Crichton points out in here is that the uh, 27 niches that are, you know, one of the enigmatic things about it, as you go up the Grand Gallery, there's these 27 niches sort of evenly spaced now, uh, uh, Ralph Ellis makes a very good case that uh, when you do the division of the 27 divided by the length of the Grand Gallery, it, it equals pi. So, they, so those niches have something to do with pi, which is you know, throughout the pyramid. But, but Scott Crichton says that there were 27 kings from the first king to Khufu. He, 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 lists the, he takes the Egyptian list and he shows there were 20. And so there's 27 niches. And uh, Alexander uh, or Andre Pochon, the, the, the French writer. Uh, oh, right yes. Here. He wrote a book, and Engineering the, the Great Pyramid. The Mysteries oh, no. of the Great Pyramid. He says okay. that there were uh, 27 statues there, that, the, that those, those, where those niches are, each one of them had a statue. And so now you got Scott Crichton finding a source saying there's 27 pharaohs from the first pharaoh to Khufu. And so he's saying that he's talking about what's going to be in that void. Now, uh, Robert Grant, who's a, uh, you know, a tremendous person, he's a polymath, he, he, uh, he's had, you know, uh, visions about that, that room, and it, he said it's going to be the, uh, uh, 
the grand the grand opus. So when we do find when finally Zahia Was or somebody punches through that camera that they're going to do up there, because I, I know for a fact that they're trying to find the least intrusive way to get to that void. And especially with this Egyptian government, because Zahia Was, as he begins to lose power, you know, he's slowly being pushed into the background. These younger guys are more, we want the world to know this stuff. You know, and they because they want tourism because they combined you know e antiquities and tourism a very strange marriage you know because tourism is hey come to Egypt Egypt is great and, and and antiquities is we sift every grain of sand we move slowly through forensic scientists so when you combine you know tourism and antiquities which they did that's why there's so much news coming out of Egypt now every little mummy that's found bingo it gets because now they're giving it to you know tourism and they oh come to Egypt look what we found. Uh, it, it, so it's golden really the ancient architects exposed. He said it's not really a golden city at all. <laughs> it's, well, it's not, well, I'm the I'm the one that broke that story before he did. I, I, I was. Oh. It's, it's funny. I was in Egypt at the time they made that discovery. I was in Luxor the next day. So I was in Luxor the day they were making it. So I've got my video I made there, not knowing I hadn't realized that day. It took me the next day on the on the boat. You can see my. I got a YouTube video. I, I think I put it on YouTube, where I'm on I'm on my Nile cruise. And I made the video saying, shame on you, Egypt. You know, you slam me because I say all these crazy esoteric things. Look at you, you big liars. You're saying it's a golden city. It's not a golden city. It was found in 1930. It's a what worker the hell city. Is the for gold? Give me the gold. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. There's no gold there at all. There's no there's nothing. It's total. So there's an example of merging antiquities and tourism. You know, you get the Zahir Was hype. But the difference is the people behind the hype now is not like, Zahir, I don't believe in that science. I don't believe in that science. Like, nah, it's... it's Zai is going to be out and pretty soon there's going to be this more openness to, to, to that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I think they're, they're definitely going to get the robots and go up there and they're not going to hide it like Zahi they're, you know, if they find some. So I, I do think it's going to be something big. So that's why, you know, I'm inter interested to find, a, you know, things I didn't know about that's kind of prophesied what, what's going to be up there. So, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. It's exciting. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to have to get that book by uh, Scott Creighton. Um, that's fascinating. I've seen that on Amazon. That's quite popular. Yes. Yeah, but you know, I, I told you though. Uh, you know, he I, he he did do a good job here. You know, this is the conspiracy to conceal the history of ancient Egypt. So he, Scott Creighton wrote the Great Pyramid hoax. Now I just I did a review of that. I think it's on my website, GreatPyramid.us. And here's here's where he's a shyster. You know. Um, so he he's got he's got to um, he's got to uh, criminalize Howard Weiss because Howard Weiss is the one that discovered the graffiti. So he's got to make a case that that uh, he's a, he's a fraud and he he hoaxed it. He 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 the the, the Zachariah Sitchin argument. Yeah, exactly. And so he talks about the Zachariah Sitchin argument. He talks about how Sitchin was a liar. Okay, fine. He's he's got that part right. But he sort of implies that maybe Sitchin was onto something. No, shut up. He's, he 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 forged it. Get out of it. Don't don't promote it. So okay, fine. So so the thing he uses to demonize Vice is when he ran for Parliament, he paid people that voted for him. So that sounds like on first blush that guy is a liar, until you find out that that was the culture and everybody did it. It's like thanks for voting for me. Here's some money. So we think his oh he's paying for votes. You know. That was the culture. And he, to his credit, Crichton quotes experts from that period, historians who say, or even testimony at the time of Vice that say, it's the custom, everybody did it. So guess what? So I, I, I make the, the uh, tongue in cheek remark that we all know Scott Crichton travels in his car above the listed speed limit. So we, because in my, in my world, like it, it, you drive 80 all the time in a 70 here and you never get ticketed. It's the culture. Culture overrides the law. It does in many places. Culture overrides the law. So yep. Vice might have known in, in a perfect world, it's not best to pay people, but everybody does it. And it's like I'm rewarding the people that voted for me. What's so bad about that? Everybody did it. So so the thing and and you look at the words that Crichton uses to talk about Vice because of that. And there are really a lot of ad hominems. He really slams him on the basis of that. But Scott, you're not, you're not really folks. He, he did what everybody did then. That's, that doesn't make him a bad person. Therefore, you scribe, you forged everything. Okay, so cut to the chase now. Uh, you know, 
he, he does do good scholarship, you know, in, in bringing out a bunch of things. And, and I agree with his conclusion at the end of the book, in the last page or so, the Egyptian government should do a dispassionate study of those, of those markings. They really should. Because as I said, and Scott doesn't admit this, but Robert Babal, Graham Hancock, yes, John Anthony West very strongly, Robert Schock have all been up there. Scott Crichton hasn't. And they all said that stuff is real. That stuff is real. And John Anthony West said in strongest terms, you're crazy. You're full of, you know, you, you don't know what you're talking about, John Anthony West said, if you say that stuff's not real. Yeah. So, so, you know, so what Scott Creighton says is that here, here's the linchpin to his argument. And think about it. He says that Vice must have found, because I saw, as Charles, when you did a program about this, you showed the three different names of Khufu that are up there. And one of them was the Horus name. Two, two of the names you have are the ones that have uh, cartouches around them. The, of the five royal names, two of them got the cartouche. But Majed, Meded, Majedu, I think is the Horus name, did not have yeah. a cartouche. And it was not known by any Egyptologist in Howard Weiss's day that that was a name of Khufu. There we go. No one knew that was the name of Khufu. So he couldn't have forged it. He would have been the smartest Egyptologist in the world. And Crichton doesn't own up to how much he, he winks at that and says this. He sort of answers it without a line that the charge exists. He doesn't talk about the charge, but knowing someone might bring it, he says this. Vice found a group of hieroglyphics, hieratic scripts somewhere, and he took that and put it up. So he's taking stuff he doesn't even know because he couldn't have known that the Majedu, or however you pronounce that, the Horus name, whatever the Horus name for Khufu is, he, he couldn't have known that he was putting Khufu's name by putting that because nobody in the world knew that at the time. So Crichton says he found a group of hieratic writings, kept it secret, which doesn't make sense because Vice was the kind of guy that every time he discovered something, he'd tell about it. But for some reason, he knows the highest- Yeah, political career, history. absolutely. And, then, and now I'm gonna and now I'm gonna forge it up there. And, and Crichton even admits that a lot of the, the graffiti up there is real. So now you got to be this detective to find out which stuff Vice forged, and which. So I said, yeah, let the Egyptian government do the work because it should be real obvious with forensic study to find something that was written 4,500 years ago versus something that was written 200 years ago. There should be a big difference in some yes. kind of forensic something. You know, Definitely. as the paint Definitely. was 4,000. So it was, seems like it should be easy to prove. So I'm with Scott Crichton to say, it, but he's hiding in this erudite book, which has a lot of good stuff in it. He's hiding what I just said. So just like I told you, oh, I, that's, I, I said I wouldn't talk about that, but there was a certain channel in which I got shadow banned, you know, today. <laughs> Charles and I talked about it ahead of time. I got shadow banned. In other words, you write something in a comment you, and then they take it out. They take it up. You still see it. Unless you log out to your account and come back in, you still think it's there, but they take it out. So I got shadow banned today. I got shadow banned today. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, Crichton is hiding stuff. Like, like I, so I'm saying, why would somebody shadow ban me? It shows they're afraid of my argument. Doesn't it show that? Why else would you ban me? I didn't swear. I didn't use an ad hominem. I didn't say you're an idiot. I just said, why don't you think about this? And they take my comment off. Okay, Crichton. I'm saying the same thing to you. It's like, why do you not say the things I just said? Because it, it, ruined, it cuts your argument out. The main argument, so that a lot of good scholarship, good scholarship, good scholarship, but the bottom line that it's resting on is sand. And, and all the, you know, I, there's a famous person, I won't mention his name, that said to me, if Khufu built the Great Pyramid, I'll eat my desk. Very famous person said that to me, I'll eat my desk. Because he's read this book. He thinks there's no way Khufu built the Great Pyramid because of this book, you're hoodwinked people. This is that there's this there's a foundation of sand here. Great, you know, Scott Crichton's probably a nice guy, but you got to explain to me, Scott, why you hid that. Yeah, you know, and you, you know, you're going to sell thousands of books, and nobody's going to listen to this little interview with me and Charles. So you're going to you're going to be safe. But you know, that, for anybody that wants to find out, read my review. Okay, so <laughs> I, I I think you're right. I mean, five thousand years ago is definitely long enough. Uh, and mysterious enough and obscure enough to not have to resort to 10,000 years because we want a bigger number. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, yeah. It's like, you know, you want a different narrative. I get that. I get how, you know, I, that's understandable, you know, that you'd want a different number. I mean, it's, it's understandable, but you know, you don't want your scholarship to, you know, 
because really stop and think about it. If you're really doing that, if you're shadow banning people, and, and this is true for the, for the account I'm, that I'm not mentioning here, you make a lot of money on tours. You're going to kick your business in the ass if it comes out that this stuff ain't the way you say it is. And Scott Crichton, yeah, you like to make money on books. I mean, or, or also he doesn't hide the fact that he wants the other narrative. So to his credit, Scott Crichton says what he believes. And, it, and so that's what we're talking about right now. What, how can you live with yourself if you really slant the evidence to be what you want to believe? You're just you're subject to your own dead religion. I mean, I, I, I swear to God, when I study something, I want it to take me where, it, where it's supposed to take me. This, this book that I wrote right here, I did not have the conclusions in mind that I came to at the end of this book. I didn't. I did honest research. I thought I was going to be, there's a star here, there's a pyramid here. There's just, I thought it was going to be simple, you know, archaeo astronomy. There's a star here, there's a pyramid here. That's not what I got led to. In doing and beginning that research, I was led somewhere else. And it really is profound. I think it's profound. Not that I'm a profound writer or anything. I probably did a crappy job of writing it. But the, what I was led to believe Orion is teaching, really, for now, not back in the fourth dynasty, for now, is profound. And so wh why you got to hide stuff? Why you got to shadow ban people? Because you're making money. If you're just out for truth, because I don't, I don't make, I take some tours, I make a little bit of money, but my God, people know, I, like the tour I'm having right now is not many people signed up because I'm spending so much time talking to you and making videos. I'm not sitting there stressing, okay, I got to make more money on this tour. It's like, I don't think about money. I got enough coming in to live on that. Let's, that frees me up to be a real scholar and yes. say whatever you want to say about me, but you know, and that's what I sense about you. You know, you look at a lot of things in different ways and that's what you got to do, you know? Well, you know, I think we should bring this to an end. I, you know, there's a lot more we could talk about, but, uh, you know, I, I've enjoyed the time and, and uh, you know, I appreciate you, you know, being willing to do this. Because actually, since I'm the one recording, this is going to be my video. So you're off the hook. You know, you can use what part of it you want to or not. You know, it will all go on the channel. And um, yeah, what I'll do, maybe I'll put it up on YouTube so you can get it. I probably won't post this whole thing as a long thing. I'll probably take out snippets of it and, and do it. I'm just thinking out loud. I'll post I the know. whole thing. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's the best information well, I've heard about Giza. It's the best, the best. Larry, you're amazing. <laughs> well, yeah. okay, maybe, maybe I'll, I will definitely put it on YouTube. I'll show it to you first, you know, through a private link. And then we can talk about it. And I might put the whole thing out there. Because again, my sense is to put it in snippets because a lot of people, how long do you think we've gone right now? You got, you, what? Uh, we've gone about one hour, one, one hour almost, uh, maybe, maybe one hour, 23 minutes, something like that. Okay. Yeah, that's long for me. I don't usually post videos that long, but I, I, I could do it. You know, if you, if, if no, people again, will like I'll, this. This is beautiful. This is a very nice interview. Okay, well, I'll, I'll post it again. I, I just, I'm going to post it on YouTube. Get it up there. Just make sure it's up there. I'll share yeah. it with you privately. Yeah. Then you, we'll talk about it. And then if it seems at that time, it, like it's the best thing to do. And, and that way it'll save me the time of chunking it because that's what I, I tend to do. I tend to, pe ten, people tend to watch like eight minute videos more than an hour, you know. And so, uh, you know, that, that's part some, of my Some thinking. people but listen uh, in the background, you know, that, while that's they're true. doing the yeah, that's true. And I, and I will try I turn all my videos into podcasts. I've got uh, uh, Anchor FM. I've got Anchor FM slash Great Pyramid. I've got a bunch of podcasts and they're mostly just the, you know, the uh, soundtrack from from these things. And really, most of the talk we've done here at the end has just been, you know, voice, you and me. You know, I stopped doing the visuals early on. So. So, yeah, it, it would make a good podcast for sure. Yeah. And which yeah. people listen to when they're running and all kinds of things. Yeah. I'd love to put it all up. It was all very nice. It was amazing. All right. well, and I'm sorry we didn't do it soon. It was it was absolutely amazing. And I've learned a lot about how advanced the Egyptians were, the pre-Egyptians or the Egyptians, whatever you want to call them, whatever the old kingdom. And I believe, like you say, it was the old kingdom. Yeah. Now, I wonder where I hit stop recording. If I, if I just end the, the broadcast, it says, like, or I see where it says, or I see it up there. Okay, I see yep. it up in the left-hand corner. So I'll just hit stop before yep. we go out just to make sure it saves what we've done. So let me do that right now. I'm going to okay. so people goodbye. Hope you watch this.